My name is Paul Denai, and I am glad to be back to my home church. Gretchen and I came to this church as a young married couple 42 years ago this month. It's uh, it been an amazing journey, and I'm very thankful that Pastor Mark gave me this opportunity to share and to give me the challenge of keeping you awake out here in the sun as we're in this new paradigm for the next few weeks. I'll be with you today, and other speakers will be following up. The opening question was, what invitation impacted you? Was there an invitation that impacted you? So many impacts in our life came from this place and the people that are here and who have gone before. And I think about all the invitations that God used, and I felt like this is just a chance to reflect on how God is an inviting God to us. God always invites us and never manipulates, never forces, but always invites. So I'd like to share a couple of scriptural invitations and some personal invitations, if you'll let me. And the, the, I believe that the whole of scripture, from the beginning to the end, is God's invitation. Will you join what I'm trying to do in the world? Will you follow? I'm making every possible way for you to join me. If you think about an invitation in church, what kind, of in, what kind of words come to your mind? An invitation in a church. What usually happens when there's a church invitation? An altar call. Thank you. Yes, that's the tradition I grew up in. And in this church, we haven't done that for a long time. I'm not going to pull everybody forward who confess your sins. But I do want to kind of do a reverse thing here because I think it's very important. That call to a commitment to following this Jesus changes everything. And if you are one of those followers of Christ right now, and you know how to lead somebody else into a relationship with Jesus, so if you already claim to be one of those followers, and you would know how to share that with somebody else, I'm going to ask you if you would be bold enough to raise your hand. If you are one of those followers of Jesus who knows how to share that faith with somebody else, would you just raise your hand? Okay, I just want you to look at, look at the hands for a second. Thank you. So if you are one of those people that says, well, I'm not sure what this is all about. You saw some hands, I hope, of people that you might know. Or if you're one of those followers that says, I don't know how to help somebody else follow Jesus. I just want to bring them to church. Let somebody else do it. Uh, connect with those people, okay? There are lots of invitations, and that first invitation to follow Christ with your whole life changes everything. It changes who you meet and where you will go. So there's a one first invitation in the Bible, and sometimes these invitations come in question form. And the first question that God asks in the Bible, I believe, is an invitation. What was that question? Those of you who know the scripture, what's the first question that God asks in the Bible? Shout it out loud. The first question, it's, it's not a hard question. It's in Genesis chapter 3, a clue, okay? There were some people that did something wrong. Okay, the question is, where are you? This is the question of God's mission, isn't it? God never stops asking that question. God is looking for you and for me. God's asking as an invitation. God doesn't need information to know where people are hiding behind a bush. God just created them. It's an invitation. Will you be a part of what I'm calling you to change in your life? That is the question God asks us every single day. That's the beginning question of the invitation of the whole of Scripture. Where are you? Where are you? Put your name in that question. Can you repeat it with me? Put your name in it, okay? Where are you, Paul? And put our community in this. Redwood City, wherever you're from, okay? Put that in there. 
Where are you, Los Gatos, California? Where are you, Peninsula Covenant? Those are the questions God keeps pursuing every single day. All the way through the end, Genesis chapter 3, there's a question of invitation, and all the way to the very end of the scripture, there's another invitation. And this is a passage that you may be familiar with in another way, often used to refer to those who don't know Jesus. And this is way back at the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. And some of you will know this from another context, the invitational context that we just talked about, where there's a question that God invites us to again. This is a passage that came to a church. This is an invitation to a church. And this church's name was Laodicea. This is in Revelation chapter 3, starting with 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write this. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, neither, not, not, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, poor, naked, and blind. I counsel you to buy from me gold in the fire that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. This is the words of Jesus. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And here's the verse you may have heard before. Here I am. I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who gives, who is victorious, I give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down on my father's throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is an interesting passage. Laodicea, you probably know, is a was a wealthy city in the middle of Turkey, and they had a drought problem. Sound familiar? They had a water source problem. They had hot springs from all around, and they would pipe in the water from these hot springs. But by the time it got to the city, it was no longer hot. Neither was it cold. It was just this lukewarm thing that they had to drink. This city was known for its wealthy fabric, from these black sheep that they would in these beautiful wool garments. And there was a, some kind of an ointment that this particular community had to solve blindness. It's interesting that this verse says, you are neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I can't stand it. Be one or the other. You think you're so wealthy, but you don't have anything. I'm going to give you white garments. I'm going to give you salve for your eyes. I'm going to invite you into a new relationship. And I'm standing at the door here. And remember, this is to Christians. This is to a church, right? I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Will you let me in? This is the word of our Creator who wants to be guest in us. And the verb that's used there, if you open the door and let me in, I'm going to have a big meal with you, not just coffee and cake, the main meal of the day. And you know what happens when you sit and have a meal with somebody? What do we usually do? We're having a relationship, right? We're communicating, we're talking, we're sharing our life together. And you will not serve me in the kitchen, you will eat with me. I'm going to be with you, and this is going to change everything. This is the life I want for you, the victorious life. This is the invitation that God keeps asking us in all the aspects of our life. Yes, there's that relational startup, but there's relational pieces all along the way that you're called to. That's not just a one and done deal when we follow this Jesus. He keeps on knocking. He keeps on asking that question, where are you? How can I enter into your life in this place right now? 
an invitation that impacted me early on was when we were students at Cal Poly finishing up our program in San Luis Obispo. Anybody here alumni there? Yeah. Okay. And a friend saw a notice on the job board for a job for a horticulture director. And he was a horticulture major like myself. I graduated with a landscape design degree. And there was an ad for a director of a program called the Kinos Home and Training Center. Anybody heard of it? If you look right across the lawn there, that white building is the home for mentally disabled adults. Started by a woman from this church, Dorothy Philbrick, for her husband when he turned 21. Jim is still living there at age 71, and they're celebrating their 50th anniversary as an organization this year. I got a job in that place as a horticulture director. I didn't know much about developmentally disabled, but I knew about horticulture and I loved this area. We moved to Redwood City. And there's a woman that I worked with at the Kinos home. Her name was Phyllis Hurst. If you knew Phyllis, you knew Phyllis. She had an infectious laugh. She never met a stranger. She said she knew that Gretchen, who grew up in a Presbyterian church, and I, who grew up in a variety of fundamentalist churches, she said she knew we were looking for a church. She said, I think you should try, try this church called Peninsula Covenant Church. I think you'll like it. And I remember walking across that bridge here and going, what is this place? That's a great monkey puzzle tree. At that time, uh, there were groups that, um, that were by age, like Sunday school classes. And two weeks after we got married in, in uh, August of 1982, we went to what was called the Young Marriage Class. It was in that room right over there. And everybody that was in there was talking about their kids in junior high. I remember we looked at each other like, this is the Young Marriage Group? Where do we fit in here? We didn't know anybody. And a week after that, one of the pastors, his name was Bruce Finfrock, he called us up and he knew that we had been involved in student leadership down at Cal Poly through University Christian Fellowship. And he said, you know, we're thinking about starting a group for young marrieds. Would you and Gretchen be willing to start bringing a group together? It was an invitation that changed our life. And there was a gathering of several couples and we were thinking about, you know, all of us are new to this area. Some of, some, a few had grown up here, but many were new, looking for fellowship. We're trying to figure out a name for ourselves. And we thought, well, we're seeking the kingdom of God. So we'll call ourselves Seekers. Which was ironic because the singles group was called Companions. But we were the Seekers. <laughs> but we lived with that name for a long time. And that group became a very important family for us. And some of those uh, you know that are now my age, it's important to start a young marriage group every five years, okay? Just saying, at least every five years. We had something in those days in this church that was called shepherding groups, where it's kind of like neighborhoods. If you lived in this hood area, they would get together once a month and you'd meet people of different ages. You know, we were living on a little tiny apartment on Poplar and we could meet in somebody who had a real nice house. We met some wonderful couples. And I remember there was a, um, a woman who had some property. Her name was Shirley Lincoln, Ken and Shirley Lincoln. They had some property downtown that was rental. And they said, she knew that I was working with this horticulture program over here. Would you, would you bring some of your crew to clean the weeds in my backyard? And I wasn't sure if we were going to move the garden over there where we were doing gardening out into the community with developmentally disabled adults. It felt risky. I talked to our director, Dorothy. She said, give it a try. Found a lawnmower found a few people. We went down to their property on Redwood and cut the weeds. And I found out that you put a stake over there and you keep going. Stop. Okay. And out of that little movement began community said, well, we need to cut my lawn. Would you come over here and do this? Would you work on that? 
out of that little movement became what we call the Moblo and Go business that employs developmentally disabled and has turned out to be a big business that's still going throughout this Redwood City. From that one invitation to cut the weeds in the yard. Another person that we met in that shepherding group was uh, a, a woman in a couple that I thought was really old, but probably younger than I am now. And her name was Marge Hilberg. Marge and Maynard Hilberg. And both Gretchen and I had this feeling that God was calling us somewhere to use our gifts overseas. I thought I was going to be an agricultural missionary. Gretchen grew up overseas in many different countries before the sixth grade, and we had this desire to serve God somewhere. And Marge knew about that because we had shared in our shepherding groups, and she said, you know, if you're thinking about going overseas, you should go with this covenant church the denomination that this church is a part of. She said, because the Covenant Church knows how to take care of their missionaries. I remember thinking, oh, that doesn't sound very spiritual. What's the big deal? She was absolutely right. I wasn't quite sure what was this thing called the Covenant, because when we looked in the back of the church, the churches that I grew up in had these sheets of paper that said, this is what we believe. One, two, three, four, five, and sign on the bottom line. I couldn't find that. And it troubled me. So I set an appointment with the pastor at the time, whose name was Paul Larson. Remember meeting over here and meeting at his office. And he had that that big person persona, you know, if you knew him. And he's he still does have that big persona. Wonderful guy. And he said, Well, you know, this covenant church is a non professional church. We don't have a statement of faith. We believe in the whole Word of God as the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. And that's it. I thought, wow. You can get along like that? You can live like that? He said, it's called freedom in Christ. And I said, this feels like home. This feels like home. And we joined in October of 1982. And then he said, I want you to meet this pig farmer in Thailand. And I remember thinking, pigs? I didn't study pigs. And where is Thailand? And this was 1980, right? Nobody had a Thai restaurant on the, in the block like we have everywhere here, right? Nobody knew anybody who was Thai. But in our little apartment building on Poplar, you know, this is what happens when you follow God. God leads you into places with people you would never expect. We knew that uh, the woman next door, her husband, was a, had been a military in Vietnam, but he had served in Udon Thani, the same city where this ministry was going on in Thailand. He told us about it. And in our mailbox, there would be these letters with some foreign script that the mailman couldn't deliver, but it had our address on it. Sure enough, the couple at the end of the hallway were from Thailand, right? Everywhere. And that began a whole series of what God has been doing in our life ever since. We were commissioned in 1987 with a two-month-old, and we served in Thailand from 1987 to 2005. And God continues to use the things that God has gifted us with in a variety of ways. We never thought we would live in the Bay Area. Who can afford to, right? We tried those years to buy in, and we said, nope. We said the never word. And then COVID hit, and God said, you can go wherever you want to. Gretchen's mom's by herself. We moved to Los Gatos with her mother in April of 21. And now I teach at North Park the mission courses with an Ignite program that's right at Mission Springs up the hill. You never know how God is going to use those invitations of what God has called you to do and called you to be. This is the invitationing, relationing God that we all follow. Think of the invitations that made a difference in your life and who invited you? Who invited you? I'd like to just close this time with a time for you to share your invitation story with somebody next to you. And then the question is, we've all received these blessings from God. This family, this place, this life that we have. Is there somebody that God's inviting you to invite? 
Who is God inviting you to invite right now? So I'm going to invite the music, Joseph, to come on back here. And I'd just like you to share a little bit of your invitation story to somebody next to you. Okay? What's the invitation story that you have? Because God is knocking at your door, asking the question, where are you? Will you open the door to this opportunity? It may be that relationship with Christ, or it may be, can you have somebody come mow my yard? Can you use me in a way that I've never thought of before? Are you calling me to another place? Okay. So share with somebody next to you, and if you have the courage, if there's a name of somebody God's calling you to invite, share that too.